All right, so we are recording and I want to welcome and introduce everybody to Diana Lempel. And I invited her onto my podcast based on um, a post I made a few weeks ago about how, um, is it possible to appropriate your own ancestral culture? And um, she had some great comments that I thought it would be fun to talk about. I'm hoping to do a couple more of these actually based on this post because there was a bit of a stir that um, came up. And I think there's just so many um, things to talk about here, so many things to pull apart and like put on the table and notice and observe and have conversations about. So um, Diana, I'm just gonna give a little introduction here uh, about her background. She has a bachelor's degree in British and American history and literature, a master's in urban planning, and which is in cultural heritage and neighborhood development and an MA in landscape studies. Those are all from Harvard University. She served as the doing history curator for Cambridge Historical Society from 2016 to 2020 and was the 2014 scholar in residence for a new Bedford Working Waterfront Festival. And in 2021 was the researcher in residence at the De Cordova Art Museum's exhibition, Visionary New England with her project which I'm hoping she'll share a little bit more about. Her project is Ancestors, the Lost Library of Latona. So welcome, Diana. Thank you for being in this conversation with me. And um, yeah, so is there any more you wanna share about your background and your work, which is really just very exciting and, and deep? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, first is, as if you can't tell from my um, from that little bio, I consider myself a recovering academic, um, and uh, so this um, this past year or so has been a real sort of unlearning and relearning time for me, um, and so I'm really um, I'm happy to be in conversation with you because that post and my thoughts about it really kind of brought me back into some of the research that I've been doing for the past decade and then allowed me to start integrating it into the work that I'm doing now. Um, I kind of think my true alma mater is um, not Harvard, but is the oral history summer school um, led by Suzanne Snyder, created and led by Suzanne Snyder in Hudson, New York, which is where I learned um, about how history is embodied and um, how it lives in the voice and um, in people and also in communities. Um, and I really sort of found, I guess like a, a calling or a real like grounding and settling in, in listening um, as a practice. Um, and uh, so it's also fun for me to be on the, on the other side of the interview um, right now. So, um, but yeah, uh, those are sort of the, the main things. And um, Ancestors is my, um, my, it's my full container right now. That's part of the integration work is like getting, getting it all into one container. So. And it's ancestors, so yeah. like ancestors and sisters. Yes. So, um, so the project started on what was going to be my dissertation. Um, I was start. I was beginning to study um, the women of transcendentalism um, and the way that they lived in space, the places that they made together, both mm -hmm. the physical spaces that they were in together, their their kitchens, their drawing rooms, the school rooms that they ran, um, but also um, but also the um, the imaginary space that they lived in together that mm. they made for themselves. Um, and uh, and my sort of primary muse, um, who actually is my fifth cousin five times removed, Elizabeth Palmer Peabody, um, who 
was amazing as and is one of my like ancestors of the of the mind or spirit um she had this vision when she was young that um she imagined a long line of women in white robes um the puritan women her ancestors um of women coming onto the american shores and settling um and they were in this long line and they were wearing white robes and they were all named Anne because she had misheard the word ancestors as a child and thought it was about sisters who were named Anne. Oh. <laughs> and she, um, she relays this story in a lecture she gives to kindergarten teachers um, because she was the, the, the person who brought kindergarten to America. Um, and it's, it was part of, her whole life's work was had in it the idea that doing history is women's work. Um, and so it's a great pun and a great image. And it had it contained kind of everything that I'm trying to do, which is, you know, on the one hand, this sisterhood, this um, ancestry, this feeling of like lineage. Um, and the responsibility to hold history and tell it and communicate it to the new generation. But it also has all of the problems, you know, it has settler colonialism. It has like the erasure of the violence and the erasure of patriarchy and all of these things. She kind of um, wanted everything to be nice. Maybe she was a Libra sun or a Libra moon. <laughs> because she just wanted everything nice. Um, she wanted harmony. Um, so that image holds both the really beautiful part of that of this work and the the really challenging part of this work together. And so that's why I chose the name. Mm, that's great. Yeah, I love it. And you and I have a shared history, um, our shared heritage, actually. Um, so you're Italian American. Do you want to share some of your ancestry? Yeah, sure. Um, so I grew up um, identifying as Italian American. Um, I my noni is um, of Sicilian and Greek heritage, and my nono is um, is from northern Italy um, and near Udine and in the um, in Friuli. And um, my dad's side is sort of a mix of British and um, French and German. And uh, so I've always, um, and it's been a process of sort of deepening into all of those things instead of just choosing the one that felt most proximate. Um, and there is also, there's an adoption in my family. Um, so I actually have a lot more um, European and early, Amer early New England American roots that I'm just learning about. Mm. Um, that are not part of our family story. And so, um, so my ancestry feels very kind of, um, I don't know, there's, there's several different, I feel like I have all the American stories and really all the New England stories, especially kind of in my heritage from, from tenements and triple deckers to, um, to early colonists, so. And yeah, the proximity, I know for me was Italian American, I'm assuming it was for you too, the most proximal culture. Um, and so, and that kind of leads into, you know, can you, the big question is, can you appropriate your own ancestral culture? And I know um, this has been something which I mentioned, I think in that post and then in my follow-up post that has, was really, triggering for me when I was first confronted with it, as I started doing my ancestral work, traveling to my ancestral homelands, like on pilgrimages and, and stuff, and realizing that in one sense, there was this deep connection and, and belonging that I was experiencing. And then in another sense, I was be becoming more and more acutely aware. I became acutely aware of my Americanness in those places and how, you know, my identity as a child growing up was certainly Italian American that was like the predominant, but also Irish American because my mom is like 
hundred percent Irish. Um, and so, and in the community that I grew up in, which was largely like Im immigrant multicultural, everybody had a, an identity such as that, you know, whether it was Italian, Irish, Lebanese, Puerto Rican, Vietnamese, there was a um, Polish was a big one. Um, so we all identified as that. And so it was kind of like, wait a minute, what do you mean? Like, and then hearing um, from different places, um, particularly from Ireland, which is interesting, but I think part of that is because they are still occupied, that having Irish genetics doesn't make you Irish. And that they're, um, they're still struggling to maintain their cultural heritage under ongoing occupation. And so um, that was hard for me. Uh, and, 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 but it was part of my work, you know, it's kind of like what you were saying with like, well, I can't just have, I am a Libra son, by the way. Um, I'm a Libra, yeah. Are you? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, but you know, you don't just get, I mean, Libra's also like this. Cause like the, you really can only let that one side of the scale go down so far. And eventually it's going to come up, back up and slap you in the face. And it's like, you know, um, and in doing ancestral work with others from, you know, the, I guess what you'd call a social justice perspective of like, you know, also we need to, we can't deny our settler the position that we're in here mm -hmm. and, and how we got here. And so it took a lot for me and I'm still working on this to be like, oh, I can't just identify as something and then take those cultural practices and just start doing them without having, you know, really what it comes down to, which is what some of what you said is the context. Um, and so, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna, I pulled some things from your comments because um, I was just like, and yeah, it's funny. You're like, you're an academic. And I'm like, you're like an embodied academic really. I feel like <laughs> I'm doing my best. <laughs> You know, I mean, because I think that's another part of this is also we've been um, disconnected from like the, you know, I always say it's like we, we've, especially as white people um, and, you know, the living the Protestant Reformation, even though I was raised Catholic, we're still the, the, the overculture is, you know, very WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. And so it's like we're living from, we've all had to assimilate into that for survival and we're living from the neck up, I say. <laughs> and so when you really bring this down, mm -hmm. it's very disorienting sometimes mm -hmm. and uncomfortable and even painful. But, you know, so I think there's a good reason to take care with it. But at the same time, we just, I feel like um, we need, to, it needs to be on the table. So you mentioned in the post, um, a, a two words together, symbolic ethnicity. And I wonder if you want to just say like, what is, cause we're talking about what's the difference between knowing symbols and actually knowing a culture basically. Yeah. Um, I, I can totally relate to that feeling of going back to the home country and feeling disoriented. And before I, before I do the academic thing, I want to tell a personal story, which is um, I, I went with my grandparents to Pordenone, um, the family, there's still um, my, my grandfather's grandmother was still alive at the time. And um, I think that's right. Or his aunt. I don't know. She was, it was a real elder, um, not just not just a grandmother, but a real elder, and um, and many generations around. Um, and uh, we, I, I went with them a few summers, and um, one time we had they had the celebratory dinner for us, and um, my grandfather's uncle is a butcher, and um, they made for us hamburgers <laughs> and they were so proud and I was so disappointed you know 
it was, I was just like, why? <laughs> you know, I had many other wonderful Italian meals and things, but this, I, I had, as you were telling, as you were talking about your own experience, that was the memory that surfaced for me was that dinner. Um, and I think there may have even been sort of Americana around. I'm not sure exactly what, but they, it was sell it. They were, in, they were welcoming their American family. And we had, you know, we had and like some exchanges with cousins going back and forth when I was a kid. And, um, you know, in, in the ancestry too, like, you know, there is um, my grandmother's Sicilian family, they went back and forth between Sicily and the US a number of times. Like, you know, there's this idea that like, we're the American family and uh, that that's not, that's just a different thing to inhabit, right? It's not that we're Italians displaced in America and that that was something special for them to have American relatives. And so um, it was so disappointing for me, but also really useful um, in that way. And also very sweet and kind and care, you know, um, they were trying to make us feel at home. Yeah. And of course, all we wanted was to desperately not be at home. We wanted to be at home in Italy. Um, so it was just a really interesting moment. Um, so, okay. I am a sophomore in college. Um, I grew up in, um, in California, in Oakland, California, um, which is a very racially diverse city with a strong um, public self of um, uh, Black history and Black power. You know, it's where the Black Panthers began. Um, and I... Um, I lived in sort of a, um, I lived in sort of a middle-class neighborhood, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was also racially mixed. Um, and I, but I went to a private school that was almost entirely white. And um, so I, here I am at Harvard, my second year of school. And I take this class called Race and Ethnicity in America. And by, with Prudence Carter, who, whose career I haven't followed, but I want to name her because this class transformed my life. Um, not just my brain, but my life. And um, I was one of the few white students in the class. Um, and we, one week, there was one week where we talked about um, white ethnicity. And it blew my mind because it was talking about me and my experience as having been raised with this idea of being Italian American. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember one, one last personal story to weave into this. Um, I remember in high school once, um, I, I posted this in one of my ancestry posts um, when I was celebrating Parentalia in February. But um, I remember in high school once this this classmate turned to me and um, I envied her so much because she was fifth or sixth generation San Franciscan. Mm. Um, and that felt to me like such deep roots. And I always envied that so much. And she said to me, I wish I was something like you. She meant Italian, like how I talked about how I was Italian. And she said, I wish I was something like you. And that really stuck with me, the sense of like how she felt like she was nothing. And I was something because I was Italian. And so, you know, all of these different experiences, um, I, and then I, here I am in this class. And um, we read, and I have it in another screen, so excuse me for sort of doing screen looking for a second, but we read um, this book, and there's also a paper with a PDF that I will share with you um, because it's publicly available and um, it's great, um, and five pages. Um, this book was called Ethnic Options, Choosing Ethnic Identities in America. Mm. And um, by Mary Waters, who is just wonderful. She also wrote a really fantastic book about second generation immigrants today. Mm. So um, folks who maybe family came from Latin America or from the Middle East and other places um, and about all of the real um, strengths that second generation immigrants today 
get from um, being a part of their immigrant communities. Beautiful book. Um, but this book, Ethnic Options, rocked my world um, because it this and this paper begins with this sentence. Social scientists who study ethnicity have long concluded that while ethnicity is based on a belief in a common ancestry, ethnicity is primarily a social phenomenon, not a biological one. Now we talk about that with race, right? That it's socially constructed, not biological. But the idea is, um, here is what she says. White Americans of European ancestry can be described as having a great deal of choice in terms of their ethnic identities. The two major types of options white Americans can exercise are, one, the option of whether to claim any specific ancestry or to just be quote unquote white or American, and two, the choice of which of their European ancestries to choose to include in their description of their own identities. In both cases, the option of choosing how to present yourself on surveys and in everyday social interactions exists for whites because of the social changes and societal conditions that have created a great deal of social mobility, immigrant assimilation, and political and economic power for whites in the United States. Specifically, this is the last sentence, the option of being able to not claim an ethnic identity exists for whites of European background in the United States because they are the majority group in terms of holding political and social power as well as being a numerical majority. Wow. That's so true. So, wow. so here I was yeah. thinking to myself, oh my gosh, like I'm not Italian, German, French, English, American. I'm Italian American because I chose and I got to choose because my whiteness has given me power and status and the option. Because you could have not chosen that. You could have chosen. I could have chosen white also, right? And sometimes, right. you know, and um, so the fact of having those choices is amazing. Now, my bisnono, who was an immigrant, who was an illegal immigrant, an illegal alien, um, and was run out by the immigration police from several cities before he landed in sort of rural central coastal California, Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, he didn't get the choice, right? Ethnicity for him was not symbolic, right? That he was Italian and during World War II, he was threatened with deportation. You know, his fan, he and his, and my bisnona lived in fear until he got his papers, you know, um, he, he was, you know, barred from many, many jobs unless the foreman like was willing to take on the risk of having someone who didn't have immigration papers on their team. You know, yeah. for him, it wasn't a choice um, because he was not yet assimilated. And so the thing is, you know, he is my bisnono, but I get a choice. Right. And that to me, and so there's two things there. The first is that choice bit, the choice and you know, privilege is the word that we would use now. She didn't use it in her, in her write-up, um, which is kind of nice. I feel like that word doesn't, that work because it's from 1990, doesn't have any of the buzzwords that we use now. So it's like, it feels very clear. Yeah. Aiden, you know? Um, privilege is a big, privilege is a big problematic word now. Yes, right. So it doesn't have that, right? Um, if you're, if you, if that term feels good to you and works in terms of helping you understand, great, but she doesn't use that word. It's just about options. Um, so that's one thing. But then the other thing is about the difference between an identity and a culture. And that was the thing that um, I think you and I in dialogue kind of got to was yeah. this, this sense that like, 
that I, that symbolic ethnicity is an identity about me and maybe my family. Like I, you know, I tell my kids like, you know, your Jewish ancestors or your Italian ancestors, and it's about our identity. I hope they have an identity about it, but they don't live in a culture that's Italian or a culture that's Jewish. And so I think your question about appropriation has to do partially with, like you said, context in the sense of like, you know, what is the difference between having an identity and having an embodied experiential sense of being part of a culture? And there is just no way as Americans, as people who live in the United States, the so-called United States, Turtle Island, this colonized place, um, there's just no way to be in this place without that hyphenated cultural experience, you know? Um, and that was, she uses the word hyphenated and that's like, um, that's, you know, you can be hyphenated or unhyphenated. We get to choose hyphenated or unhyphenated. Um, and I just think that that is a really important thing. And then the next part is that like, um, you know, being part of, what does it mean to be part of unhyphenated white culture? And, you know, that's to be assimilated, right? Is to say like, you know, we're, you know, I get to choose to be assimilated. And I think part of this work for me, I had, I, I feel like it's about de-assimilating in a way that says, you know, basically this idea like my nono was an illegal immigrant. Not like my nono came from Italy, bootstrapped himself up to being, and now I get to have the option of being white or not. But it's to say, I am present with the experience of my bis nono, and I too, you know, um, care, I still care about immigration and the immigration police and, you know, all of that stuff. And so like, that's what de-assimilation de kind of means to me and that's what the ancestral work is kind of for. Um, but I think it's also about like, um, so it's about like, you know, getting back to the idea that like I have an ancestral culture too and, you know, we're not, um, sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting all off on this tangent, but um, it's something like being, I feel like there's a difference between imagining that I can go back and claim the culture of my ancestors at some earlier time, whether it's, you know, pre-immigration, you know, 20th century, or whether it's pre-Christianity, you know, whatever it is, like to imagine that I can just go back and claim it and use it and bring it here and imagine that 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 journey from there to here doesn't change it um that's what i imagine that's what i think is appropriation do you know what i mean yeah and i think you know i think so you basically we're talking about dislocation and alienation mm -hmm. so some of the things some of the things that and i think part of this white culture patriarchy we i think we can add to that capitalism sure and so it's like capitalism alienates, right? So it's like we have a labor force, which well, Italian Italians specifically, and that those ethnic groups um, that came during that like late 1800s, early 1900s to work in the mills and factories, um, you know, they were a labor force. And then they're the part of the process of capital accumulation is alienating. And then you have people dependent on the systems of production for mm -hmm. survival instead of whereas in southern Italy they were dependent on each other in their peasant communities mm -hmm. I mean um well, this happened all over Europe and other places in the world as well but um so and so the the alienation of the alienation and then what was the other word that I was thinking alienation and assimilation um Dislocation was that the dislocation, word? right? And so then you're right, and so then you're extracting. So, 
So, but there was an organic process. And to me, that's part of the, part of the ancestral work is like there actually wasn't, and I, my biz Nona went back and forth um, as, they, I guess they did that. I'm like, I can't imagine doing that. Like, no, she went back like seven months pregnant with my no-no and had that, him, had him yeah, yeah. Labria, yeah. you know, and then he got stuck there because of some of the immigration stuff that was happening here. He couldn't, he was born in 1914 and didn't leave until 1928 because they yeah. couldn't get him out. Wow. And then he traveled alone as a 14 year old or whatever, but. Which again, um, today's story, like, you know, we being present with the stories of immigrants today is like, and, and refugees and migrants and, um, and evacuees like those are the st those same those stories are in us too well i know and that's where some of it so, and i think that's also part of my work has been as a white person as um a second generation immigrant myself uh, is is saying to others particularly italian americans hey it hasn't been that long since we were we were doing this and then in my Irish lineage. It's like, you know, we washed up here. I mean, we didn't have paper because everybody, well, we had, you know, we, our ancestors came the right way, you know, and it's like, mm, I mean, not really. I mean, the Irish, they were half dead. They like washed up on the shores in Boston and New York city. And, you know, they were dragged onto the railroads and enlisted and, you know, there was, or they, you know, skipped skipped ship. my my great grandfather from Ireland jumped ship and ended up in New York and then you know he was illegal so but so to me some of it is well what what so now we're here and and we've been so we've been disconnected what happened mm. <laughs> right like how did we and then how how did those how did those cultures change and what do we have what we have we have some symbolic ethnicity we have an identity perhaps and that was when I sort of stopped at some point identifying as Italian and, and even my work as like Italian folk medicine, which I still use sometimes, but now I'm adding Italian American folk medicine because that was my, my embodied experience. Yeah. Yeah. I think like, um, and there's another story, there's a family story about, um, my nono going back to um, Friuli when he was young as a kid. And um, he said, he said at some point, he said, sono strak. And everyone burst out laughing. And what he was using was the dialect to say, sono stanco, I'm tired. Uh -huh. But they had kept the dialect and, and they burst out laughing because no one said that anymore. You know, no one said that anymore, but in it, but in, but in his family in, in the outskirts of San Francisco, they were still, they were still using the dialect that they had come over with. So there's the sense of time moving on too. And like the way the culture in, in, um, in our ethnic enclaves or even just in our families, um, how, when we when we lose contact, and this is sort of the dislocation point, like when we lose contact with the the soil or like the 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 source, you know, the fountain of this culture, it like rigidifies and stops changing unless we connect with the new source. And connecting with the new source, of course, has all kinds of perils and challenges. And that's what I admire so much about your work is that you're really actively trying to to hold that. Um, and so I wanna um I wanna bring in like another thinker that um really helps me with this a lot. Um there's this little book. Um and I had a I had a storefront in Cambridge for three years and I liked it so much that I had a little stack of them that I would loan to people if they wanted it and they could bring it back because I wanted everyone to read this little book. It's called On Tyranny. It came out, I think, in 2016 or 2017. Um, and I can't remember if Timothy Snyder is a historian or political scientist, but um, it's a really, really smart little book. And it's got like 10 principles or something about um, how tyranny works and, um, 
it was, it's beautiful. And um, one of the things, or he has a term in that book that really helped me with this stuff. And um, he talked about the idea of the politics of eternity. And he said, the politics of eternity is concerned with the past because, um, but in a self-absorbed way, free of any real concern with the facts. Mm -hmm. It is a mood of longing for past moments that never really happened. The past as a vast misty courtyard of illegible monuments, all of them equally distant from the present, all of them equally accessible for us to use. Hmm. And, yeah. and to me, that feels like really central to this conversation that you're having, this idea that like, you know, we can take, like, like I was saying before that like, you know, we are entitled to just sort of like lift things from the past and bring it here and plop them down and bring them back. Now, I love revival. <laughs> like in my, Insta in my Instagram profile, I like revivalism is one of my, I've been obsessed with revivalism my entire life, but especially in my, all of my research has an element of this. Um, and, uh, and I love to do it too, now that I get to um, do things beyond writing books and which I never did. Um, so, but beyond writing now that I can do things, not just write. Um, I love revivals and, um, but there's this, there's this tension in this urge to revive um, and this urge to bring things back from the past, um, which is that like um, the term that, that histor historians use is ahistorical. You, when you like, you take off like all of the stuff between there and here, you take off all of the entanglements back there and you just lift it up and bring it here and say, it's a thing, you know? You imagine that like, you can just lift up. I mean, imagine in a museum, right? You see an object, you know, you go and you see a case and there's an object. But in fact, that object was in a setting before, surrounded by other things and surrounded by the air and the soil and the smells and the smoke and surrounded by the people and the language that they spoke and all of those things, right? But we take one thing and we put it in a box and we say, that's the thing. And um, I think we do that a lot. Um, I do this with ritual sometimes, with stories, um, and uh, but without the culture all around it, we put it, we're putting it into a new culture and, uh, and that's okay. Yeah. But you can't do that without knowing that that's what you're doing. Exactly. Exactly. And that's some of what, what part of what, where that post was coming from was not, okay. So yeah, sometimes we are going to, um, and sometimes we're going, we, we are going to I need the identity or we're going to a attach. We're going to latch on because we're human and we are seeking emotional stability and we are seeking belonging. And this gets into the psychological ideas of secure and insecure attachment. And it's like, we are insecurely attached. And so we're going to like, you know, and, and, and maybe that's okay. You know, and, and that's okay. That may lead us into, it's okay if we don't stop there. It's okay if we don't stop our awareness there. It's okay if we don't get confused that the identity or the symbol of the thing, which is why I liked what you said so much, is the thing. So it's like, this is not the thing. This is something that, we, this is a remnant, right? This is like a little living thread that we still have that we put in. And, and I also, you know, I do believe our ancestors are, are we are our ancestors right? They created these traditions out of, you know, it's like at some point there was no traditions and somebody started them, right? So it's like, we're, we're in that ongoingness of yeah. creating human culture. Yeah. It's an, it's an, it's an emergence. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's not, oh, we shouldn't be doing our, we shouldn't be re reclaiming or reviving mm -hmm. whatever we have. It's, it's just knowing that there's a difference between the symbolic and I, the identity of something in the actual embodiment 
or being in the context of something. And then, and then you know, the question is, um, you know, how how do how how do we contextualize it? And and I don't know, but you know, it's kind of like you said, that's my work. I feel like it's like, well, how 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 is this going to like play out here? Because you know, the descendants of Europe are not going back to Europe yet. There's been irreparable harm caused by their presence here. So we can't continue living in a in white supremacy. And, and I, I mean, 300 years ago, we could, I mean, it's just like, it has to stop like 300 years ago, really. And so, um, so yeah, I guess one of the questions that came up, came up to, to me from others was, is, a, is cultural appropriation the right language around it? You know, and I actually think it is. I mean, I think, and I think you described it really well. And I think that was, that, that was some of what I was confronted with is it's like, you just can't go back to Ireland in particular, because that's the place I've been most distanced from through time and assimilation and grab Irish pagan traditions and then come over here and be like, I'm an Irish pagan, right? Like, well, I can do that, but it's really, um, it's a lie. And I'm, when I've been to, when I go to Ireland, like I can see, oh, this is, this is, a, this is a interesting story. So I was at a retreat with a um, Irish, oh gosh, if I can remember her name, Karen Ward. Um, and she has an organization in Dublin, Dublin called Slee on Kwa, and I'm probably, I'll put it in the notes because I'm sure I am um, not pronouncing it right. Anyway, I was at a retreat she was leading in Massachusetts and I was talking to her, you know, about famine trauma basically and, you know, just how I'm still, li feel like I'm still living that because of what you said. Like mm -hmm. it stopped, we got, we left Ireland and that's where Ireland left us as well. Yeah, and you didn't get to integrate, right? Like our our lineage didn't get to do so in um, in attachment work. Um, there is this process called like um, match, mismatch, rematch. Do you know about this? Mm -mm. So like the idea is, um, so I, I have little kids, and so um, let's say they say something. And um, I totally don't get it. And you know they they want they want to go outside and then you know have a drink and have this particular drink and then come back in and watch TV or whatever. And I misunderstand it and I I I go outside and I say okay it's time to have your drink and watch TV let's go inside. And they you know they melt down they lose everything they drop to the ground they kick and scream and I'm. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I don't know what's happening. And, um, you know, their needs are not being met. They had an, they had an expectation, which is very close to a need at this time in life. And, yeah. um, and uh, they weren't heard um, because they wanted to have their drink outside, let's just say. And um, so they settle down, whether they do it themselves or I help or whatever. And then I say, oh, you wanted to have your drink outside before we go inside. I forgot about that. Let's, I'm gonna go inside and get you that drink and we're gonna have it outside now because I didn't remember that that's the order that you wanted it in. Mm -hmm. You know, that's rematch. Like some, mm -hmm. some huge number of our human communications are mismatches totally. where we just miss each other, right? And especially, you know, when you start having, like I was saying before, when you have like really loaded terms or jargon or something like that, or just, you know, from my experience, people who come from two different fields and use similar words, but they don't mean the same thing. And everyone's got like layers and layers of things that they've read and thought and lived that go behind the word. You know, so some huge percentage of our communications are mismatch. And it's the rematch actually that creates stable attachment. And so what happened, like, I'm just thinking yes. now yeah. that's what you're describing is like, yeah. you know, you, 
we didn't get, you know, this thing was linked. It, that That's the version where I picked up my kid, took them inside and say, I said we were going to have the drink and watch TV. Right. That version. That's like kind of what, I mean, in a way, like I'm just thinking about it now, but that's, I kind of feel like maybe that's a little bit of what the immigration experience is. And we ne- you never got to rematch. Never got to say like, oh, I are like, these things happened and then new things happened and then things changed and then this happened and then that happened. It's like, nope, solid break. Now we have to go do this other thing and we have all these new traumas, you know, on top of that. that and that never got, that never got, that never got assimilated and, or uh, integrated. We got assimilated. Yeah. The trauma never got, the trauma yeah. never got integrated. Yes. And, and so, and then in an animistic sense that, that trauma takes on a life of its own. Yes. I mean, it becomes this, this being. And, and so then, and I, you know, and I, my, my theory um, on white culture and some of the ongoing violence and harm that's being caused by white supremacy has to do with these unintegrated ghosts really that are, that, that, and so some of, so my ancestral work actually came out of anti-racism work. Like I, I did that, did that, well, I did psychology, did group dynamics and nonviolent communication, which is where I learned, I don't know how anybody communicates anything to anybody. Yeah. Right. Like with our communication, the communication skills that we're conditioned, we're trained in. It's like, we're we're just constantly not communicating. Um, And then, and not listening to each other. And then, and then, um, and then, and then I realized, oh, I can't really, and then my, my work with plants, like, I can't really ever be here without understanding and knowing and becoming aware of what I've lost my personal history as long as, as well as my ancestral history. So the other thing that we don't know, most of us don't, don't know, all right. Like we don't know what, ha- you know, I know this, I knew that my no, no stories about Southern Italy. I didn't, you know, I, it's, it was later in life when I realized about the Risorgimento where the unification of Italy. Yeah. Cause I knew, you know, he said, well, we didn't have this, we didn't have that. I didn't understand why. Cause of it, I didn't get taught Italian history. We get taught, American history here. Well, nobody I knew was here when American history happened. And it's not saying that we shouldn't be taught the history, American history, but that that had really no relevance in my personal or familial lineage. So I feel like that's part of it is like, okay, that that does exactly what you said, this creates a stable attachment where it's like, okay, even with the discomforts and the pain mm-hmm. and the and the loss. And the reality of being in a position of white settler here, um, that's stable attachment, yeah. right? It's like, oh, okay, now I can see. Now I know, I don't know where we're going with this, but I know at least we've got some semblance of being oriented to, the, oh, to where we are. And that's where it's like, so, I, I don't know what it would have been like to have been born in Italy or to have been born in Ireland. Then I would, then I would have, that would be a completely different embodied experience, but mine is here. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And I like, um, one of the things that, um, I've done a lot of work cause I, I went to school for urban planning. Um, I, I started thinking about this stuff in terms of neighborhoods. Um, and communities, not in terms of individuals. And part of my integration work has been this, you know, getting to the the personal, internal and familial level and thinking about trauma and how it's lived and not just how it's expressed in a neighborhood um, or a community. But um, I think spending time with loss is so important. Um, That's something that you said. And I think um, like, one thing that I see a lot, because a lot of this work that I've done has been in a field called public history or public humanities, um, 
one of the things that I, I've experienced a lot is that the way we want to talk about history or heritage, and actually some people use this word, use history and heritage to express this difference, is um, celebrating the past, right? Like that's sort of the, that's what we do. We celebrate the past. We honor the past. And of course, like we honor the dead. We honor our ancestors. Mm. Um, but like, and so that's sort of the heritage mode and the history mode is to try to understand and um, what, what we call perspective take and do exactly what you're describing, which is like put ourselves in the shoes of someone else with all of the threads that connect us to the wider world, right? And, um, you know, in the soil and the air and the smoke and the plants and all of these things, right? Um, and uh, and that's history work, right? History is a process of imagination, but not a self-absorbed, um, a historical imagination where you're sort of imagining things as you want them to be based on now, but instead um, a real process of really trying to imagine the texture of things. Um, and uh, I think that there's a lot missing. I think we skip the loss and grief step a lot and go straight to repairing. Um, whether it's in neighborhoods that have, are experiencing the violence of gentrification and displacement, or whether it's it's neighborhoods that experienced um, urban renewal and like the true violent displacement of having their communities bulldozed, um, or whether it's you know something more subtle like you know your over generations your family left the ethnic on like first they left the homeland then they left the ethnic enclave you know, and now it's just you and your atomized family or you and your atomized self and your friends on the internet who share an ethnic background, you know, um, like, you know, starting with loss and grief, um, I think is like really underestimated, but that's like, you know, you, you mourn the dead, you know, you, you have to, or else they don't all, they don't get to be ancestors. Right. You know, and since each of, like you said, since each of these attachments in each of these places in an animus worldview is, is a, is a being, you know, we have to mourn the being that is that community or mourn the being that is that street or mourn the being that is that Sunday parade band that went down the street or whatever it is. And um, I think uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that when a community experiences the feeling of loss. So I'm going to go back to symbols for a second. So when I, um, uh, when I had the privilege of working with Laura Orleans and the New Bedford Working Waterfront Festival, she's a folklorist and she runs this, <clears throat> now it's actually um, a heritage center um, in New Bedford, Massachusetts, which is um, uh, one of the most valuable, if not the most valuable fishing port in the continental US. Hmm. Um, and this festival celebrates, um, this festival that she started in 20, I can't remember what year now, but anyway, um, she started this festival and then this heritage center, um, for, um, the fishing industry. And it was really interesting because the celebration began in the context of loss. Mm -hmm. Um the you know whatever your opinion is about the fishing industry um their you know the ecological degradation of the oceans and government oversight of the fishing industry and changing um economic conditions the consolidation of the fleet which was enabled by which was further enabled by the um the government regulations um and also changing structures, kids going to college and not staying to be in the family business, you know, all of these things, immigrant assimilation, um, all of these things were creating a real sense of loss of this really tight um, company town feeling that this waterfront had. And um, 
you know, it's called a working waterfront festival because the industry wasn't gone yet. It wasn't, you know, Mystic Seaport or one of these places where there's like a handful of picturesque, you know, lobster vessels going out. It was like, it's a real fishing port still. And Laura realized as a folklorist that like, this is a point for narrative intervention. Like this is a point where like telling stories and keeping this and um, telling the story of the culture was really important, but they'd already lost so much. They had lost, um, they had, there had been a strike in the eighties that was busted up, you know, in the whole like strike busting era and, um, and the union was busted up, I mean, um, and their, the whole system of how fish was sold on the waterfront changed and, um, and uh, no one would talk about it in the beginning. And so she felt, she noticed the relationship between celebrating what was still around and making space for letting the grief come in. And um, it was a really important thing. And what I started to notice was, and this goes back to the symbolic idea, um, I, I started to think about my other, think back about my other projects. I did, uh, I did, um, I wrote my thesis on this, um, this produce market in Boston, which had been around for a hundred years in the current state and had been going for like as long as there was a waterfront, like informally. And it was mostly um, Italian Americans historically, like in the 20th century, who were the vendors at this produce market. And um, it has this very like salty Boston immigrants like culture. And um, if you know Boston um, and its history, there was a big highway that went through it, bulldozed one mixed. Um, kind of mixed mixed race mixed race immigrant neighborhood the west end and separated the north end the italian neighborhood from the rest of the city mm -hmm. um, which is a really amazing story um but um in the time that i was working they had just taken down that highway that barrier and created a park and so was there was this like new thing where like you know that neighborhood now was more accessible to the city there was all this new beautiful you know all all of this real estate that used to face a highway now is facing a park like new access to the waterfront like all of these big you know um things were happening in the city and um and so i'd done that project and um and a few others and what i noticed is that every time this loss becomes imminent the importance of the identity gets stronger Hmm. So when 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 fewer people in the city are making a living from the fishing industry, the importance of calling it a fishing city gets stronger. When fewer people are actually Italian American, the importance of saying "Hey, Bizon" gets even stronger. You know what I mean? Totally. When when when, when you know when young finance people start moving into the Italian neighborhood because it's closer to the waterfront, um, it's more important to put the flags up. You know what I mean? You know, and it's important, like it is still a real cultural center. People come from around the, around the city or around the region to go to the, the festas in the summer and things like this. And I took, I take my grandparents there when they come and they like love it and they feel so happy and so at home and stuff, but you know, the stores close and they're replaced by yoga studios or, you know, it's, it's funny that a yoga studio, which of course is a very specific cultural tradition became my emblem of like just white globalization, which we could talk about that another time. Um, but <laughs> But my point is that this, the relationship between the loss of culture and the importance of the symbolic identity happens on an individual level for us. You know, we are separated. And so we want to call, like we've been talking about, we want to call ourselves this thing, or it feels really important for us to ground in an identity, but also happens on a, like on a bigger level as well. And I think making space for the feeling of that loss and noticing noticing i don't know like just the whole story you know um not just not this idea of equally distant from the present you know what i mean like not letting things be equally distant from the present like letting things be historical and that they change over time and letting letting things be flexible and um 
and to change. And because that's, okay, my last thing that I'm going to say about this is the best, the best analogy that, and I've really, I've just sort of landed on this and I think it's just right, um, that I can think of is sourdough starter. So like, you know, like they do these archeological digs and they dig up these starters from the ground and they still right. work, right? right? Like the moment they come out of the ground, they're in our air, they're getting our water, you know, whatever plastic particles are in the water that they use to feed it, you know, like they're getting the, um, they're getting the, the, um, the grains that they're fed, you know, whether they're GMOs or not, whether they're, you know, whatever hybrids they are, whether they use M or wheat, that's, you know, that's um, a heritage grain. And, um, but like, whatever it is that it's, it's still, it came from that starter, but the moment it comes into contact with being revived, it changes anything else. The yeah. moment it comes in contact with anything else. Yeah. I, I and mean, so it's, Go ahead. I just like, and so to me, that's the perfect, you know, you can make your own sourdough starter out of the air that you breathe. And it's a sourdough starter from the place where you are, or you can have it hand down for a hundred years, you know, or you can dig it out of the ground in an archeological site. But, and so it'll, it'll, and it has, it'll have whatever the conditions were in which it was developed. And then it's going to keep changing and it's going to feed you, you know, and exactly. that's, what matters. that's the most hopeful thing I've heard. And I mean, that's just like, you, I feel like you just landed on everything for a minute here. Like you just, you just said, oh, so, yeah, yes. all sourdough. Start, and it's, 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 I, I mean, I think culture and right. And that's the word culture and not just that, but you know, it's a mother also, that's another word we use. It's culture, it's mother. And the idea is that like a culture is um, my favorite quote is that um, a culture to have culture is to inhabit a place sufficiently intensely as to cultivate it. Like that's by Edward Casey. That's like one of my favorite quotes. Mm -hmm. And so I love that. that okay. culture, the word culture to me, like that's what it's all about. It's like all of the things living and working together as a single organism, you know, it has integrity as itself. And it also will change. And, it and, and, and that can't happen unless we realize where we are, where we came from, who we are, where we came from and where we are now. And that includes, like you said, the loss. Yeah. And, and you can't, you can't feed, you can't eat from it unless you feed it. Right. And if you don't feed it so that you don't contaminate it. Then what it's going right. to do is sour and lose its power. You know, so you have to feed it and in feeding it, it changes and it, it becomes part of your place, whatever it is. So if any Sicilians are listening right now, I'm sure, there are. Welsh, I'm sure they are for Welsh English folks, um, in, in the home country, I am looking for sourdough starters from the places where my ancestors Ooh. immigrated from so that I can bake with the mix of their places in dialogue with my place because the starter I use I made wild here which is cool actually my son made it I should say that um he made it he's very proud but um but yeah that's like something that I like I'm so hot on this metaphor now um that I want to actually use it and let well and that's that's spread. embodying that's actually yeah. embodying the metaphor right I mean yeah, that's, right. Some of, that's some of the somatic aspects of this that we, that's part of that's part of the work yeah. is is yeah. actually is actually bringing it into our bodies and I, I can't remember who I was listening to who said you know sometimes the ritual I wish I could remember to give this person credit but I can't because I listen to so many things um, maybe it'll come to me but you know rich in terms of ritual uh, we do the ritual sometimes and we don't really know like we don't have to we don't we like i also like we don't have to completely embody this culture and know everything about it and know our whole history and all our ancestry in order to begin to cultivate yes right yeah. like 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 we don't have to like it's not like you have to eat the whole elephant at once right it's like it's impossible not to mention it would just be so overwhelming and it would just like blow us up so it's like and the grief and loss would blow us up too it's all you also can only digest so much of that at once without the cultural support, social support for it, which we don't have. I, what, when you were talking about starting celebrations with, 
loss. I always thought about that here. And I grew up in a, an Italian enclave and then I moved up to the foothills here in a very white, um, like historically Dutch community. Everybody here is like taller. I never knew people were so tall. I'm like, I feel so short here. But anyway, um, where was I going with that? I was going somewhere with that and I can't remember. Where. Oh, oh, so we go, so we have these, so they have these like um, community that, the you know, the we have a historical society here that the, and, and I'm looking at the historical society book one time and it starts in like, you know, 17, you know, like, well, like there's a, you've, you've, the history of this. And then I always feel like, like we do memorial parades. My kids were in the band and we had to go to memorial parades and veterans and like all these. And, you know, we start with the Pledge of Allegiance and, you know, all the things. And it's like, never do we mention the fact that there were people that were murdered and pushed off this land. Like, and, and, and I'm not saying we have to like make it really gruesome or anything, but I feel like, like there should always be an honoring at the begin, opening of any ceremony of here, for instance, would be the Haudenosaunee, the Mohawk people. Like we yeah. never think them or the ancestors of this place. We always start with 1752 when the first colonists arrived in yeah, that's why I think a, a couple of things like that's why I think the wheel of the year is so um, powerful, like um, it, and because different different times of year and different observances can be container that I was going to use the word container like, you know, a crock or um, a, a culture has to live in a crock. It, it, it'll it just melt and or it'll just like die and like blah and dry out if it's not like held in something right so um it just keeps giving this metaphor um but the you know but the container of ritual is really important especially for something hard or something really big right so that's um you know the wheel of the year gives us time you know you don't have to do it at every single thing you can have some, just straight yeah. up celebration right but you can also have times of year that are for grief you can have you know i really so i um i um was brought up for part of my childhood um with jewish traditions mm -hmm. and um i think the jewish calendar moves through like um moves through this sort of um, up and down of different mm -hmm. kinds of emotions in this really beautiful, powerful way, you know, where you have, um, you have Yom Kippur, you know, but you also have Rosh Hashanah and those are really close together because they're so heavy, right? Rosh Hashanah is the apples and the honey and the sweet new year. And you want it, you know, you want it to be so sweet that it drips from your, you know, from your mouth and you lick it off your fingers. It's right. so like, special but then you have Yom Kippur where you you know you really go in and you say you know I have fallen short of the person I want to be you know and you do that you do both and um same with uh with Passover right like it's this very like solemn solemn but also joyful holiday um I've always thought that I really think that Thanksgiving could be very easily I wrote about this last year during Thanksgiving on Instagram like I really think that Thanksgiving has the potential for being a pass like a Passover like holiday or a Yom Kippur like holiday that just like if you just change the emotional tone of this holiday this observance is what I'll say because holiday implies happiness but observance mm -hmm. you know if if it just if we just allow it to be in a different emotional place mm -hmm. you know it could be a different kind of thing and I think like that's the wisdom I of um folk traditions and folk religion, but also, you know, I think a lot of religious traditions as practiced outside of, you know, the capitalist, um, capitalism, especially in American, like, um, context, like, you know, the way they were imagined is that there's space for catharsis in them, you know, there's a, there's a climax, there's a, you know, whether it's the tarantella or whether it's other kinds of dancing, you know, it doesn't have to be in the religious calendar. It also could just be in the folk traditions. Like, you know, you get that stuff out. And um, and I, there's, you know, so you just, there needs to be containers for those things. And it doesn't have to be everywhere. I think we get, we get really kind of, and I think it's 
partially because we communicate so much by text now, like not by text message, but like using writing where there's a sense that things can be a lot more complete. And that also because you don't encounter necessarily the same person over and over. So you feel like you have to be able to communicate both yourself and your position and all of this stuff together in one place. Um, so, you know, and also because we're not in context with each other in general, like my context isn't necessarily your context. So you need to tell me about it for me to understand it. You know, that's, that's really challenging. Um, and so there's the sense that we have to do all of be in all of these places at all times we have, you know, and we can hold them as a culture, but we can't do them all at the same time. Right. You know, and so, um, but making space for them is important and finding containers for them is important, you know, and it doesn't, um, grief doesn't necessarily mean like self-flagellation. What I mean by grief is just sitting with the, with the experiences, you know, it's, I think. Right. That, and I think, I think that's a big, I think that, you know, to me, so I, I and also the joy part, yes, the joy yes. part about all and, and with ancestral work, there is a great joy of like, Oh my gosh, you know, this is the same thing that my Nora used to do, or, you know, or I found out I'm, you know, I have ancestors from here. I didn't even know about, and now I'm listening to this music. Like there is a joy. And I feel like, you know, it doesn't, and this is some of it, it doesn't have to be all like, Oh, I lost my culture. I lost my people. And I mean, there's going to be time for that. And that's there, or, you know, it's like, Oh, I don't belong here. I don't belong there. Like, it's not all that. Right. It's like it. And, and in fact, falling into that is, you know, is not helpful. And, and so it's like, yes, connect with your ancestors. Yes, connect with your ancestry, learn your traditions, practice them, make the sourdough starter, you know. Right, feed, feed them, the, figure make, out what they do now, right? Like how do they run? How does it, yeah. Right, you know, like, fig, you know, exactly. And then, and then, and then we don't know. And then, the, and then some of the other part of it for me is like, the, um, there is just this uncertainty in terms of America. And I have a, I have one last question for you. Sure. If you have time. Yeah, it's fine. Um, is, what is America, a cul is there an American culture? Because mm. I feel yeah. like there's like different, you know, it's like, well, this is an unculture, you know, and then other people have said to me, well, no, there's an American culture. You've got, you know. Well, thank you. This will allow me to use the other note cards that I <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, okay. So, um, one of the things uh, that I really loved um, at one point was um, taking um, a couple of courses in a field called cultural sociology, um, which is, it sort of starts with um, this guy, this French guy, um, Pierre Bourdieu, um, who has a concept called habitus. Um, and the ha a person has a habitus, it's, a, it's an embodied word. Um, and Can it represents H-A-B-I-T-U-S, habitus. Habitus, okay. And um, it, a habitus represents the way group culture and personal history shape the body and the mind. And as a result, how they shape the social actions of you or an, as an individual. So like your habitus is basically your way of being in the world. It's everything from how you hold your body and your voice to um, the frameworks that you have for how to behave in a certain setting. Cultural sociologists call that a repertoire, which is like what you think or know about what's appropriate behavior in a setting and the different tools that you have for different um, behaviors in different situations. So like maybe a lot of people are familiar with um, the idea of code switching. Yep. Code switching is a repertoire practice, mm -hmm. right? So code switching is, um, I think, tradition, I think like originally it was used to describe how black Americans move between the, um, the habitus of their um, home communities and have to, this is, goes back to the idea of options. They have to change right. in order to perform in a um, American white dominated society, right? Especially at school and jobs and things. But, um, but your, your repertoire are just like the, the way you know how to be. And um, different classes and different cultures and communities 
um, will share um, elements of their habitus. And then, for example, um, crossing, um, crossing class lines, for example, or assimilating into another culture will change your habitus. But maybe there will be things that don't change, right? And this is like, um, this is, this is like, I mean, we all know this experience, right? Like this, this lands like, oh yeah, like I know this, like I know that the way I dress and the way I talk, um, that other people can tell things about me, you yep. know? Yep. And, yep. um, and that there are ways, you know, when I went, when I went to Harvard, I learned how to wear pearls, for example, like, let's just describe it that way, you know? Um, and, uh, and I was trying to signal something when I did that, you know? Um, and, uh, so I think, so to your point, there's lots of cultures and, um, there can be, um, one of the things about a repertoire is that as you, when you move between different settings, you make use of different things in your toolkit. So like there is a culture of like, I love, I love, I think it's important for us to talk about family culture, like the smaller, you know, the sort of smallest, there's the individual, um, your habitus, and then there's like the family culture, right? So like um, your family culture is like, you know, how, what kind of jokes you make or, you know, what kind of activities you like to do, um, what your values are. These aren't things, sometimes you like tell your kids this stuff explicitly, but a lot of it is just how you are in the world, yep. you know, and that's your family culture. And so, yes, there's an American culture. We could think about what that is. Like, how do you behave in, in the most public of settings? Right. You know, that, that could be American culture. But, um, and the extent to which you know how to behave indicates the extent to which you have assimilated or are, are at least know how to be a part of that culture. Yeah. Um, but you could also say that like institutions have cultures, for examples, right? So like, I know how to behave, like one of, um, one thing that probably people are familiar with the idea of like um, cultural capital, which is like, if, do you, if you know about certain kinds of culture and you know how to behave. And so this is a different, this is culture in terms of like cultural production, like arts or music or sports or things like that. So it's like, do you know how to behave at the symphony? Do you know how to behave at a basketball game? Do you know how to behave at an Italian Saints Day festival? You know, like that's your cultural capital. And um, I use those different examples because traditionally we think of like high culture and lower culture as being like in a hierarchy and certainly Bourdieu, um, he came from France. And so some of the critique about it, um, about his work is that um, he really saw it this way and um, implied that habitus was really like a, a sentence of like where you, where you sit in the hierarchy of things. Yeah. But, you know, but we can say, we can, we can understand that this is a good, that this is a framework that's useful without want, without agreeing with or um, upholding the idea of the strata. Um, but, uh, but the idea is that like knowing how to behave in different contexts is your cultural literacy, your cultural capital. Um, and, uh, and so I think that we sort of, um, make culture, like you said, we make culture all the time. And the way you do it is with the other people around you all behaving in certain ways, mm. right? And um, bringing it to the idea of behavior and actions, I find really useful because it gets us out of this really like values laden um, way that we talk about things, um, which isn't bad, you know, we need to talk about values, but like when we're in each other's presence, which is not the same as online. And it's interesting, like, I think there's a culture of Instagram, for example, that's right. different from the culture of Twitter, different yeah. from the culture of TikTok. And there's even like, there's cultures or subcultures within that, right? There's like, there's, um, you know, wellness Instagram, or there's like architecture Instagram and whatever it is. And like, they do have different cultures too, but there's not a whole lot of idea about behavior because we don't behave. We just type and scroll. And most people don't see us doing any of those things unless we actively engage. Whereas if you are at a concert hall, say, and it's your first time at, um, at a, you know, at a classical music concert, 
and you you thought really carefully about what to wear and you you ask people beforehand about what to do when it's happening and but you you can still feel really uncomfortable is my point and other people can see you mm-hmm. and it's the, it's the it's you being there and them being there together and in each other's presence and behaving and seeing that makes the culture and so it's kind of hard to understand what culture means in the context of um, these digital spaces because we only have one way is there's posting and there's commenting and then everything else you're invisible um and it's very it's very um and you can walk away from it i mean that's the other thing i put my phone down yeah it doesn't really matter what somebody just said or did or posted or whatever because i'm not in that i'm i'm in another place Yeah. But I mean, I don't know, like you feel it in your body if it really rattles. For sure. Oh yeah. 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 Totally. Like, right. Like, like, but it's, it's almost like, it's not like if my phone dies, it's (laughs) right. And most not like my neighbors. So like I live, I live in a, in, like I said, a predominantly white conservative, um, community where, you know, I'm kind of rad, I'm radical witch here, um, on the edge of town. But you know, where you belong on the edge of town. It's like, right where I belong. <laughs> um, but you know, and but my so my neighbors, I, I actually don't know how they vote. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. Um, I I there's so many things that don't come in to play in my social interactions in my community because it's not really relevant. Yeah. I mean, unless I got into a conversation about it with them, which I wouldn't because, yeah. you know, so, so, and, and yet we, we get along peaceably and we support each other in different ways. And there's, you know, different forms of trade happening and, um, and collaborations happening and pe- we show up at the town meetings, people coming from all different political positions and, um, you know, and, and, and hash things out together. And then we have to live together. And so there's also this accountability Mm -hmm. that, that is face-to-face accountability, especially when my kids were in school where it's like, I have to see these people like, like, you know, and so there's also much more, um, I feel like there's more cultural effort made to, um, to, work with others in a way that's going to be um, more collaborative, I feel like then. So there's definitely, a, there's definitely a big, there's definitely a big difference, I feel like in my body. So like in terms of like, yeah, I can feel what's going on in my body, like in, you know, Instagram, you know, I mainly do Instagram and, and a bit of Facebook. I, you know, I can feel that for sure, but I can also, it's not the same. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and you know, those digital platforms are so challenging because also like the culture, the, the container is made by algorithms and designers, which are made by, by which aren't part of the culture. Right. And so like, there's things about it, like the fact that it's a square, you know, that we didn't choose, you know, and that's really, that's a really different kind of thing. But what I want to say is you might argue that, or you might say that the culture of your neighborhood is to not talk about difficult things for the sake of getting along, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes and no. I mean, definitely there's been, there's, so, right. There might be, but really it's not. And part of that is because this is, so this is not also like, this is not it, it, this is where there's differences, right? It's like, this is a poor community. It's a peasant, we're peasants. And, um, and, and there is a lot of, there's conflicts and there's people calling on people's dogs and somebody accused the Amish of stealing something from their front lawn and getting their other dog pregnant. And, you know, and my neighbors in the town council and, you know, we had a, we had a confrontation at the town board meeting um, where things were, there's not a lot of pretense here. Yeah. And yeah. some of that is that I feel like that's one of the endearing things about being, I'm, I'm in this like hill 
foothill. It's kind of, it's very Appalachian, even though we're in New York state, but it's kind of, kind of got that. There's, there's not a lot of pretense as well. Yeah. So maybe it, you would say instead that the culture is to focus on like the immediate, like immediate, um, community needs and issues. Yes. Like not, not to extrapolate out to wider topics. It's not right. direct. It's very focused on like, what, what, how can, what do we, what do we need to be to each other? You know, what are the challenges that we have and things like that? Is that and that's part of the part of insulate. I feel like that insulates us from some of this outside, some of the bigger outside issues, because it's like, you know, I have friends that are part of the Green Party, which I, I totally love the Green Party. But at the same time, I always, my critique always was, I just don't think it's actually going to speak to a whole bunch of people who can't, who aren't thinking about, they're not thinking about the climate crisis for better or worse, because they're dealing in a more immediate crises yeah. of, of getting, of getting food on the table. Yeah. And I feel like any climate culture has to go beyond environmentalism in conservation if it's going to appeal on a political in a political level to to the majority of people who are poor. Yeah, yeah, right. And that goes to the idea that like you know there's a political culture and there's a journalism culture, and when you have mass media, you consume the culture of those places and the assumptions that they make and the words that they use. And then um, when you see like, um, you know, we talk, you talk about code switching or having a repertoire, but there's also dissonance, right? Like what, what, how do we resolve it when something that we encounter in one cultural framework that we exist in disagrees with, or is dissonant with the other, another cultural co framework that we're in. And that's like, um, like, and what do you do? Do you fight it? Do you try to figure out how to integrate it? Do you ignore it? You know, like how, what do you do? And I think that that's, um, you know, that's, that's certainly like the immigrant experience for sure. You know, like what happens at home, like the language at home, like, do you let it go? Do you fight to keep it going? Do you like sort of, you know, give like, a, like give it symbolic attention, you know, like how do you handle that? Um, you know, it's a really, it's a really challenging thing to live. And then in. where, and then what do we let go of? Yes. And, and yeah. I feel like that's always a big question for me is, is, you know, there's things that we're just going to let go. We're going to let go of. And your descendants can pick them back up again. Right. I think also like, you know, we focus a lot on ancestors, but I've really been thinking a lot about how, and this goes back to the sourdough analogy, but also just, you know, it's really important. Like um, our descendants are the other half of the story. Right. Totally. And, and we can get to know them too, you know, we can dream dreams for them. They're going to have our DNA and our ancestors DNA in them. And those of us who've birthed children, our descendants DNA is in our bodies too. You know, our children's like cells change our cells. And so, so like, I think, um, you know, I was thinking about this and how like my, my, my nonny and I, like she, you know, she's from city people. You know, they they lived in Boston, like first in the North End in those, you know, in the tenements and then like in um, ethnic enclaves in the suburbs. And she's, you know, I've been telling her about, you know, I'm like outside digging up roots or whatever it is. And she's like, oh, my, my family didn't do any of that. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't learn any of this. I didn't like magic. I didn't learn any of that. You know, like we, we were so, you know, we had lost that long ago basically. And I'm like, oh, well, no, like, you know, you taught me how to cook, you know, like, look mm -hmm. at all the crocheting that you do, you know? And I also, I said like, that's okay. You had to do that. You know, in, in, in trauma work, right. we talk about how, you know, how you have to honor and like really congratulate and hold the parts of you that had to adapt for safety, you know? Totally. And like, and, and so I told, I told my Noni, I was like, you know, that's my job now. Like I'll, I'll, 
I'm doing this work. Like you did, you did your work. Like you got us here. Got us here. You know, we're stabilized enough to be able to do it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And so, you know, my, my, they did have to give stuff up, you know, but now, but now I can get stuff back and there's things that I need to give up. And maybe it's things that they did like, you know, adaptive things, just like with any trauma on a personal level, like things that don't serve you anymore. Like maybe there's things that don't serve us anymore that I need to get rid of, but like, you know, hyper, like hyper, hyper states of hyper arousal, <laughs> like chronic states of sympathetic excess. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, there's those things and there's like, you know, maybe, um, you know, yeah, just, um, fear and, um, and I don't know, I, I don't want to get too far into this, but I think like, yeah, maybe there's things that I can let go of, but maybe there's also things that will serve my future descendants that they can get back. You know, like maybe my paranoia about the end of the world, like maybe I need to let that go, but maybe like in two generations, like they'll want to remember how to immigrate. And so I need to like, I can right. keep, like keep shepherd those stories through without being in the fight or flight place, but I can like, you know, preserve the memory of that. And, um, and I think this is that we're, what we're talking about is contextualizing. Yeah, I think exactly. it's, re, it's like, re, it is locating because that's, this is it. Our, our descendants are, are, we're going to hand them whatever we leave off with. <laughs> They're going to get it. And, and then the future is going to go from there. And, yeah. and so for me, some of it is also holding a vision of the future. Yes. You know, what kind of world do I want my grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren to be in? And yeah, and I think focusing so much on ancestral and ancestors, like the reason why we do that isn't because we need to bring the ancestors back. Right. The reason why we do that isn't because we've lost something and we need to go back and get it. The reason why we do that is because of our descendants. Right. Or because we're just, you know, part of this, like this thing. And until we like locate ourselves in relation to all of that, you know, um, then, then it, that's, yeah. In the present moment, us and also the future, like that's, that's where um, being present with it, I guess, like you said, contextual, that's the thing that I Mart Martine Prechtel talks about creating origins and mm. that, you know, our ancestors had their origin and we have our, we're creating origins. Yes. Right now. Yes. I'm obsessed with origin stories. And I think it's so interesting that our culture is obsessed with origin stories right now too, right? It like speaks to this feeling of loss, the like, you know, where did Spider-Man come from? You know, like we got to go back and find the origin stories of everything. Um, I think mythic origin stories fit are a big part of this politics of eternity and give me the opportunity to talk about my very last note card. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> which is, um, okay. So um, I, another moment in which I was like totally blown away, um, was in a talk by this um, French sociologist, French political scientist, philosopher. I think he's a philosopher, let's say, Bruno Latour, um, who has written a lot of stuff about a lot of stuff. Um, he has, he wrote, did some really interesting work on um, archaeology and how archaeology decontextualizes artifacts, kind of like I was talking about before. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and how science does that in general, really interesting. Um, but he would gave this talk, he stood up there um, with his French accent and um, he told us a story about how the world in the 20th century, the 20th century was obsessed with a vision that he called the globe. And the globe was this idea. He said that it was like exemplified by that view of earth from outer space, you mm -hmm. know, and when they, and they, the, the big blue dot or whatever. Um, he said it was like, in, it was in, like epitomized by that, this idea that like, we are one big family, you know? And I think like my childhood in the nineties was kind of like the last dying cry of this, you know? We were like, everything was, you know, it was the Clinton era, it was all, it was all like, um, everything was about diversity and there we were sort of 
thinking that we could keep this dream going. You right. know, the whole <laughs> world is going to be one big world. And, you know, and um, now we might call that globalization, you know, but <laughs> and we would. But um, but the idea was that this was going to bring new prosperity and like and um, togetherness and all of these things mm -hmm. to pull around the world. That's the globe. And that was the vision. It was like the post-World War II vision, right? And that's what everyone was working towards. Um, and he argued that climate change and the sense, the realization that the earth is finite in a way that, and I have trouble, I think about this in terms of um, abundance thinking sometimes, and I, I would love to talk about that, but he had this idea that when climate change sort of slapped us in the face, um, that vision collapsed. And there's probably like socio-political things also, you know, um, but that it was really the experience of the world being finite that made that globe vision go away. Now, on the other side of the spectrum from the globe is this vision, which will sound familiar from Timothy Snyder's um, Politics of Eternity, the land of old. And the land of old is this idea of just exactly what it sounds like, the sort of eternal past. That's the past that we want to stay in, <laughs> you know, because things were better there. I don't know exactly what it was, but it was better mm. than what we have now, which is a collapsed vision of the globe. And so what he described was that in the absence of you know, this vision, the globe has been proven, you know, they're like, I remember the WTO protests, you know, when I was a kid and like, you know, it was starting to collapse. Right. And um, we were realizing, you know, it, I don't need to give the whole story of history, but, um, you know, the globe collapses. Now, what do you do? There's certain people, there's certain groups and power interests and things that would like to keep this alive right? Either because they still believe in it, because they haven't had the conceptual frame change of like, it really, it doesn't work anymore, or they, it suits them, you know, and there's both going on. Right. But a lot of it, a lot of us are looking back at this land of old and saying, that's what we've got. We left that behind for this. I don't right. want that. I want this, you know? And um, this is seductive because it can be whatever we want it to be because it's just monuments in this dusty hall that we can like bring up and bring back, right? Um, and uh, to me, this was the best explanation that I had ever heard of like culture right now. Um, and, uh, but he said that there's another model, which is the what I think you, you are doing and what we're talking about here. There's, there's this other model, which he conveniently doesn't deal with the, um, the gender aspect, which, if I could talk to him, I would ask him why. Um, but he calls Gaia, based on Gaia theory, which was developed by a woman scientist in the 70s. Um, which uh, is, James, uh, Lynn Margulis and James Lovelock. Thank you. Yes. yes. Um, he also mostly talked about Lovelock, which was also interesting. Um, but he said he described it as, he, his definition of Gaia was a new model shared with the formerly dispossessed that is interconnected in which human agents render, render themselves sensitive to their own actions. And he had all these slides about, you know, like Gaia theory, which is like, there's, you know, there's this like thin band of the earth where we all live and, you know, we're all interconnected in this thin band on the earth. And he said that like, it's Gaia that is the alternative to the globe. But, and, you know, he's a philosopher, so he stops there. But then I say, okay, how do we build how do we make Gaia? Like, how do we bring that vision into the world? And how do we say, I understand Land of Old, why you're so attractive and why I am drawn to you, you know? But I can't, but there's, but this is not real. Right. This is not real. The, it's the, it's the, it's Gaia that's real, you know? And um, I love Gaia theory and I love Lynn Margulis. I'm going to put a link. I'm going to put a bunch of links. I'll definitely put a link to um, her, her work. Um, yeah. She's so good. She, she's passed in like 2011, but she, she came up with this symbiotic um, theory of evolution, which, which, you know, and, and now all this talk of viruses and stuff, we're seeing um, how that, 
it's becoming more and more founded, less and less of a theory. And, um, and, and seeing humans, I actually just posted about this today, um, just how humans are actually part of that. That was exact. I was like, oh, you just said it all. What am I even going to say today? <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> just say, we're, you, well, you know, this is some of it when you spent, so one of the things I've been fortunate to have is, is being in, in, in a, poor post-industrial community is there's a lot of wild places. And so I've spent a lot of time watching. And when you do that, I feel like, and participating in natural cycles. And, and when you do that, you do question some of these narratives that are human-centered. Yeah. And to me, one of the human-centered narratives is that we have all of the say over what's, what, what happens to the planet. And so the collapsed globe theory really is very human centered that 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 it, it similar to what what I think some of the th some of the conspiracy theories that are going on right now with the virus and stuff where it's like, you know, and not that anything is impossible, but, you know, to think that w the only way that a virus could take hold like this is if humans had something to do with it. Mm -hmm. and, and it's to me, that's that's the same with the global collapse theory and some of our environmentalism goes in this direction where it becomes fundamentalist, which we're seeing now in what's happening in the West Coast with these forests that were environmentally protected. Mm -hmm. And so human activities were kept out of them other than you know little trails that everybody had to stay on. And, and now they're burning down because there used to be constant human activity. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I love that. I love, and part of that for me was informed by Gaia theory, where it's like, if you pay, and then if you just, if you look and you see what's happening, I'm no different than that butterfly or that bee or the black bear. I'm a part of this ecosystem. And so for me to sit here, you know, in like in my house and like, I don't want to step on anything or I don't want to cause any problems or I want to do any more damage um, is is exactly it's colonial right yeah. it's exactly the kind of thing that we're trying to work against yeah and i like um i oh, what was i gonna say i saw a bear yesterday so i got distracted thinking about how i saw a bear um but the the idea that um oh i was just, I, what i was gonna say was that i really think that thinking about beavers is so powerful you know that there's like you know i live um I, I'm looking now behind like a, a layer of trees at um, a mountain that the people who are native to this land, the Pocumtuck and the Nipmuc people called the Great Beaver. Um, and uh, when I first heard that, so it's this, it's this mountain along the Connecticut River. And um, it's, uh, the story is that it, um, the beaver was not fully sub it, the, for, the the beaver was changed into a mountain um but was not fully submerged by the water so you can see like the hump of it mm -hmm. um, to this mm -hmm. water body and um you know it's a it's an ice age story that's like handed down um but what i recently read was that this um that beavers take on this like mythic gargantuan scale because of the gargantuan scale of their impact on the environment. Mm -hmm. And that like, they are the engineers of a landscape, you know, especially a, a river landscape. And so thinking about beavers and like how much effect they have, you know, and right. that, that what, what would it mean to feel empowered to have an effect on a landscape as you know large creatures you know and different creatures like you know we are like humans are different from other animals because of the ways that we evolved like what would it mean to be to participate in this landscape basically just what you said but i think beavers are especially powerful and, and, um, and that's what indigenous people did yeah all over you know and and as i said in my post today where i am which is haudenosaunee territory i mean they were an extremely advanced agricultural society that were were um, able to create these amazingly sustainable and abundant um, um, villages and communities and culture 
in relationship. And um, so, yeah, so this has been such a wonderful talk. I feel like we, I feel like I, I just, I've, my mind is kind of blown with some of the things that, that the sourdough thing, I feel like is, I'm going to be thinking about the sourdough thing for. I'm so glad I'm, I'm yeah. <laughs> I feel so, and also because food has been in my work, my entire life, it's been in my life, my entire life, but also it's been in my work since the beginning. And I keep trying to feel like, trying to ask, like, how does it fit in with the rest of this stuff? Does this just mean that I'm doing food festivals all the time? Like, cause that was kind of the, what, where it went in the beginning, you know, am I just doing dining events? Like, is that what this is about? And it's like, no, like this, you know, this is, but you're doing this. alchemy. You're like, yeah, you're like the <laughs> operational framework for everything. And so I've been really, I'm so glad it meant, means as much to you as it does to me. Yeah. Food's been a big food to, you know, food definitely takes on a, on a, that's also been part of where I live here because we are rural and we're remote. And so we, ha I have to cook, even though I don't, if I lived in a metropolitan area, I don't know that it would be my choice to do that, but we've had to be really innovative here with that kind of thing and even getting food and, and whatnot and growing food and things. So, mm. well, thank you, Diana. I really appreciate all that you have to share and look forward to continuing to follow you. And for our listeners, um, I will put Diana's Instagram, which is at the ancestors. Is mm -hmm. it at, at yeah. the ancestors? Mm -hmm. um, and I will put links to your website and um, some of the other things that we, I tried to keep track of some of the um, people that we mentioned and whatnot today. So yeah, there are some PDFs that all the ones that are like, you know, nice to read. My, one of my, one of my professors, my favorite said, is it good to think with? So some of the ones that are really good to think with, I'll, I'll share because. Great, great. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thank great. you.